from the shores of beautiful Lake Coeur d'Alene in the heart of North Idaho. Local, regional, national, and international guests discuss their topics on our forum. The North Idaho College Public Forum. With your host and moderator, political scientist, Tony Stewart. One of the great privileges of doing this program is that no matter how long that we do it, we have a new subject from time to time that we've never discussed before. Uh, after doing this program for 28 years, it continues to be the practice. I'm very pleased to announce that on our program today, we're going to talk about anthropology, psychology, and ecology as a systematic, holistic approach. And our guest is very qualified to do this. I, in fact, I would say uh, that I know of no one we could have on this particular subject that would be more appropriate to be with us. I welcome to the program Susan Braylon Becko, who is, uh, I would call, a consultant on integrated ecology. Uh, Susan, if I may call you that on the program, mm -hmm. I welcome you and we thank you for being here. And we know your work has been done in Australia and in the United States, and uh, we certainly will be getting into that very soon. I also want to welcome to the program uh, a longtime friend, Nancy Flagan, uh, who is, I shall call tonight, a student of Susan's in this program, in this theory. And I know, Nancy, you've traveled with our guests to Australia. And so thank you both for being here. We appreciate it very much. And as always, I'm so pleased to have our two regular panelists with us tonight, uh, or today. The program of Tom airs today. Uh, and that uh, uh, would be Janelle Burke, who is an attorney in the state of Idaho. And next to her is Steve Sheen, who is the vice president of college relations and development at Northfield College. And we will invite Janelle to commence today's questioning. We're talking about this holistic approach mm -hmm. to life. How would you introduce this to a new person? How would you tell us about it? Um, I would start by saying that integrated ecology is, is based first on a philosophical point of view um, that, that is formed around a belief that we have a commonality that's anchored um, deeper than our separatism. Which, um, so it's based on a vision it has a visionary impulse, a philosophical belief that physiologically and spiritually and uh, psychologically we're anchored to the land. And it's an exploration, an inter uh, interactive exploration of, of uh, to understand that. And, uh, and through that to appreciate diversity and to challenge um, the root core issues around separatism. Um, and to address that. Now, Nancy, you are a student of, of Susan's, and you've recently been on a trip to, to discover some of these principles. And can you tell us a little bit about where you went and what you did? Well, Susan had, uh, I have been a student of Susan's for uh, two years prior to the time that we planned this trip to Australia. And during that time, it was our dream that as Susan discussed uh, uh, what Australia was all about and, and the, the powerful uh, influence that has been in her life and the people there who have been a powerful influence in her life. Uh, and it was one of those things that just kept growing and growing until the trip actually occurred. And uh, uh, she led us uh, into uh, a, a community of Aboriginal people, the Mimli community, um, where we had an opportunity to view the Aboriginal culture from a standpoint that very few uh, people in our culture have ever had an mm -hmm. opportunity to do so. And it was uh, not only a unique, but a very, very pleasurable experience because we had been very well prepared for this. And rather than uh, experiencing what I would refer to as cultural shock, we had a kind of uh, cultural, we just kind of blended in into the culture. And I think Susan did a beautiful job of preparing us for that and then to allow us to learn some wonderful lessons as a result. Steve Sheen. Susan, you, you used the word uh, separatism in your answer to one of Janelle's questions. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if you could talk with us a little bit more about that. Um, in a broader context maybe, but first as an Australian, um, I, I haven't visited, I don't know much about Australia. It, what little I know is that it's a, it's a large country, not populous in U.S. terms, certainly mm -hmm. not in uh, Asian or European terms. Uh, I know there are indigenous cultures there. 
beyond that, I don't know know much. What kind of separatism would exist in Australia, and in in, the, in a broader sense, as you might apply it to a world community? Well, I I think that separatism of itself um, is you know is going to be there. It's when we um, the Aboriginal community that I'm talking about in Central Australia is fairly still untouched mm -hmm. by the way we live, and uh, so there's an opportunity to you know to be part of something where there's there's not a suspicion or an untrusting or a political agenda attached to the interaction but but it's um, when we have a, a belief system or a, um, that we're attached through our insufficiencies in other words that through the race culture or gender or religion or economics we start to um, attach through a lack or an absence rather than through abundance, then we, we run into trouble. So that separatism itself um, becomes a, a really big problem when we start to believe it's the only way or we have the one truth or the only truth. And that was part of the reason of taking people to see very traditional people that couldn't meet any agenda that you might offer them or couldn't even interact mm. in a way that you might expect them to interact. So you have to you have to um, re-examine your criteria for success, progress, mm -hmm. um, what it's worth, you know, what is worthwhile, what is not worthwhile. So it, it just throws you back onto some deep motivational questions and uh, it, was, it was good. But before the show we got to talk very, very briefly and we mentioned Western culture. Um, if you were going to give our audience just a very brief description of Western culture in terms that relate to what you're talking about here, separatism and the value that we get in our connection with the land and with Aboriginal cultures. Mm -hmm. well, how, how would you describe Western culture? Oh, that's tricky because I don't like really to get into negative well, and, and positive. I don't, but <laughs> right, okay. Characteristics. Let's not, well, you know, let's not make them well, value-laden, but what characteristics would you assign to? Well, I think we have a lot to offer and a lot to learn. Um, I think we have a, a lot to offer, but um, but my experience is that um, that people are uh, that sometimes the structures that we live under can be uh, constrictive and restraining, and they're as I said before, I think a top-down initiative rather than a bottom-up initiative. I call it working our soil. Mm -hmm. You know, what are our resources? What are our potential? And how do we um, assess the need? And so the Western a Western model, as I see it, and this is you know. Um, to be taken with a grain of salt. There's more, a lot of goal focused or more about mm -hmm. productivity um, with not a great view to um, aligning with life or life enhancing uh, lifestyle about outcome or um, sometimes um, the application of something onto a finite resource, a need onto a finite resource without a good clear look at what you're working with. And um, so. You know, there's a lot more that we could go into. But I, don't, I don't want to put words in your mouth, and I want to avoid some of the value judgments that you or that we talked about just a second ago. But um, if I'm understanding a little bit about, about what you're here to talk with us about, um, to me, Western culture, there's tremendous caring and generosity there, but it's, it's focused on the individual. There's, yeah. there's not a lot of communal structure it's in Western. Yeah. There, there is room and um, for a more inclusive model a more um, so that we don't arrive at truth maybe by excluding but by what can we bring in what can we include here um, that knowledge isn't threatening that difference isn't threatening it's actually needed a diversity is needed to create a harmonious balance and without diversity you actually w uh, weaken the whole organism whether it's the land or a person mm -hmm. or a community that it's actually weakened through a lack of diversity so, um, so there is an individualistic uh, kind of focus more in the Western culture, and this is um, more based on a continuum, more of a continuous pulse, a continuous movement that that is afforded to us and offered to us through a, a natural rhythm. Um, so the the work is focused around that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I intentionally waited until my round to mention to our viewers that I've seen your portfolio and your resume and all and. You've worked with a lot of academicians at universities, and I have lots of letters that you gave me from professors and, and the work in, in anthropology and psychology and all the areas we've talked about. 
uh, and also at the same time you've worked with native tribes in this country and in, in, in Australia. And, and so you've had experience and, and, and uh, work in the different cultures. Mm -hmm. And so from that and from the questions that Steve was asking, uh, could you share some more with our audience uh, from the non-Western world, or at least in the Western world, uh, native tribes such as in North Dakota, because you've been, um, what in some of the, the cultures that you've worked with, uh, how is life perceived in relation to nature and the environment and ecology that is different in approach uh, than what uh, some others in the culture would, would find a, more of what Steve was discussing? Um, I think that, um, and it's very hard to speak on behalf of Native people, I wouldn't pretend to do that, but from my own experience it appears that um, there's a different accountability, that the accountability is long-term, uh, seven generation, it's a, a long-term vision, that there's very little thought for me, my, mine, now, it's more about we, our and us and long-term accountability. There's a forward accountability to the land and there's a backward accountability to honouring ancestors so that, that me as I stand here today is not unrooted to what has gone before and what will come after. So that accountability is a, a big factor. And the other is that, uh, that a spiritual core or a sense of belonging lies at the centre of every endeavour and that's, that's a huge difference too. So there's, a, there's an appeal as it were through um, every behaviour, every action or behaviour is, um, is often initiated or governed by some kind of um, spiritual appeal to be, uh, what they say, walking the red road or in, a, in an appropriate behaviour. Um, so there's always a reflective, there's a contemplative aspect to a, in a tribal mentality too, a very contemplative kind of reflective attitude that isn't just um, about doing but about being and that's that, that was the big one of the biggest things for me. Nancy I want to take the advantage of you being here as a student because that really makes the, the, this really wonderful to be able to make this comparison. You come from a different background than, than your teacher uh, being here in the United States all your life and, and, and our guest coming from Australia but you've also now had the, not only the, the teaching but you've had some experience if it's not too personal, I would like to ask you, as a student for some time with Susan, how how your attitudes change in some way. How are you a different person now than you were before, both uh, meeting Susan and also the experiences and the travel that you've done? Mm. What kind of different perspective do you have? Uh, it it took, took me a, a long time to um, to understand. Uh, the philosophy of integrated ecology. Uh, it, in the beginning, it seemed really foreign to me and very difficult to grasp uh, what Susan was attempting to teach us. But uh, she's she was uh, she was she's very constant in, in her work. Uh, she leads us through uh, much of it with uh, such a determination, and. Uh, expects from us uh, results in, in, in the sense that uh, not demanding them but uh, allowing us to uh, to speak freely and openly about uh, when we are confused or, or when the, the work isn't particularly clear to us. Uh, I think that the trip to Australia was an amazing revelation for me because all of the things that Susan had taught us uh, in theory, uh, and, and they're wonderful theories, and, uh, and, and many of them we were able to relate to and to actually uh, demonstrate. I Can think. we get a specific of uh, an example? Well, um, uh, part, of, part of the work that we do, of course, is going right out into nature and uh, allowing what we find there to become relevant to something that, we, that, that is going on in our life. In other words, are you appreciating and understanding nature in a different context? From a different, yes, from a different sense. Uh, it's almost as though uh, if you allow this work to progress that uh, you begin to see things in nature, within nature. Things you've from a whole, before? Exactly. Things that, that were apparent, always apparent, were always there, 
but were overlooked. What, what, what would be something like that? Uh, oh, just the existence of a, of a flower or a tree or uh, perhaps a configuration in nature. Or the balance between them. And, and sometimes the balance, sometimes just uh, weather patterns, things that were going on uh, w with the weather and um, how we could connect to that. Um, I think what I, what I observed when I was in Australia was that uh, the practicality of the teaching. Because I was able to determine that, um, and, and we were speaking of this earlier on, that what, what was becoming very apparent to me was that there was a lot of room for change. And that change is what uh, Susan's work and Susan's teaching was bringing about within me and within the other students. And it, whereas I know, and I know you're trying to pin me down to something that's, that's very, um, that, it, that's difficult for me to do, mm -hmm. but I can say that it has been a life-changing, uh, certainly something that has build, built me into, uh, into a new, raised me to a new level in my own consciousness. I, I'm always thinking of our viewers, that my commitment, my dedication, and I know they sit there and say, okay, what are the exa examples right. of how have I things changed? Yes, I can help you with yeah. that. Susan. It's, it's, it's awkward because it's in a learning circle format, so individuals are um, invited to really expose themselves in group and discuss um, the ways they self-assess or self-value or the ways that they um, lack or have absence in certain areas in their life related to uh, core separatist issues, which would be, you know, um, religion and race and color, and then defining their absence or their place of lack or absence or fear, then to um, anchor back to the seasonal rhythm or impulse or that continuum through sensory input, three out of five, you know, three out of five senses, and to, by anchor I mean anchor in the face of fear or hold an image or a universal principle. So people are invited you know, one, to be able to look at facts and specifics in nature without sentimentalizing or humanizing, and two, to then find a universal principle or a governing principle, and three, then to um, honor their subjective reality. So there's, there's three things, and each of those three processes is, is time-consuming. First of all, to identify a place of absence as a core separatist issue, and then, and then to... Um, and then to look at, make an observation, a sensory observation, um, and to, to look at the facts or specifics and be able to st articulate that without a value-laden judgment. And then to find a governing universal principle. And the third thing, to honor the subjective truth so that we see that our subjective truth is here. And the facts are here and there's always a learning that sits in the middle of not just nature but, but life, really. And that they might be learning it through the mechanism of integrated ecology, but the actual study is about life and, um, and honoring a subjective truth or a personal truth, a universal truth, and a factual experience of what is. Janelle, and, um, I would take it then that you would study the seasons of life that is, birth, age, um, and eventually death um, and that you would relate that to. This, our surroundings. Um, yes, I. It's a little bit different, Janelle, in that they are those those um, phases provide the stimulus, if you like, okay. um, that give us what we need to work with. So that I would look at maybe um, in nature uh, a four-fold process or a five-fold process, and I would look at um, uh, things like the way we offer and give, the mm -hmm. way we initiate the way we do closure, uh, the way we contemplate. And I would link those to um, the transformational processes in nature. In other words, the simple processes of um, what I call blossoming, budding, root, seed, and shedding, and link them to initiation, offering, contemplation, and closure. And, and so um, we always have a, um, an environmental stimulus or impact that we can work with for the issues. So... It's a deep inner work, basically. It's something you continually learn from. I have to ask you, Nancy, um, 
a good number of years ago, Nancy and I were carpooling to uh, school together. Uh, we were students at Gonzaga University, and we carpooled together. And uh, a lot of things have happened since that time. And now you've had your Australia trip. But while you were on your Australia trip, what kinds of things happened uh, when you were dealing with the people? Was it easy to talk with them when you have language barriers? Um, did they look at you as if you were different from them? Um, because certainly we are very different in our clothing and our appearances. W what kinds of reactions did you have? Oh, it, it, it's, it's, it was such an amazing experience. Um, and, and I'll go, I'll, I'll go right ahead and, and be as graphic as I can be. Um, uh, on television. On television, <laughs> that's, that's right. Because uh, for me, I, I, I integrated something, something during that trip into myself that was not there before. And, uh, and I think that, I can, uh, that by describing what happened, perhaps I can, I can make that process a little clearer. Uh, when we arrived in Australia, uh, we went almost immediately into the, the Mimley community, which is located right in the bush. And uh, we lived outside, essentially, during this trip. We slept out under the stars and, and had just a delightful experience, uh, one that was unique to almost all of us who, have, who were on this trip. And when we went into the community, we had no, we were not aware of what we were coming into. Uh, we had been, there had been some descriptions given to us of what we could expect. But um, to get into the community, into the Aboriginal community, um, was, was quite an experience. We drove, we drove into the community, uh, and we, uh, were, we sat for a, a number of hours, actually, waiting to, uh, for the people to uh, accept us to allow us uh, to, to move around pretty freely. And because Susan, of course, was, uh, was acquainted with the people in the community, uh, we felt confident that this was going to come about. But there was no assurance that this would come about. Because these people are free, of course, to accept us, or perhaps not. We were going into their community. And, and uh, even though we had uh, obtained permits and that kind of thing. We've gone through mm -hmm. all the political process. We were not sure that socially they were going to accept us, even though we had come bearing gifts and across the world. <laughs> and, and 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 wanting very much to be to be accepted and to be a part of what was going on in their culture during that short period of time that we were together, and and they were most gracious hosts when when the when the warmth was established when we finally. Uh, became uh, comfortable with each other. Um, there Do you touch? Was there touching? Mm -hmm. uh, or is it more of a, 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 a facial, uh, some kind of way of knowing that they're happy with you? Uh, they're, they're, they're very, very happy people. They're very expressive people. Uh, touching, you know, actually it was one of the most intimate experiences of my life, but not so much from that standpoint. We were uh, taken out into the, the bush by okay. the elders. Um, we experienced uh, digging the um, Wichita, we the Wichita grubs. The and, Wichita. And, and then a part of that is that they offer them to us and that we eat the, the grub as a, a show of respect. And also to, to join the two, I assume, to join for them to feel that we are somewhat joined to them. And mm -hmm. th that was the feeling that I had, and, uh, which was a, a remarkable experience. And then, and then climbing the hill with them, the elder and his, and his wife, and uh, then going back into the village and, uh, and celebrating with them, presenting our gifts and uh, dancing with them. The women elders decorate, uh, decorated us. Uh, we danced. Uh, without clothing, um, and that was certainly something very, uh, without clothing above the waist. And they, but they decorated us and, and allowed us, and, and we had fun in that process. There was, but great respect, there was great respect for that. And uh, certainly something very unique in, in my, my experience, but a very loving and, and close 
knit feeling that you had with the people. Thank you. <sighs> Susan, what sparked your interest in this field of study? Um, boy, I think uh, when I was six, 16, I was interested in um, land. And by the time I was uh, 19 or 20, I'd formed an organic growers association in Queensland, New South Wales, one of the first there, and um, trying to convince people that they needed to pay more for a spotty banana than a clean banana, and um, so it started founding that. And then, and and just I think it's just a deep passion uh, for exploration and investigation, and uh, you know, just a, a love of people and differences. And um, I've always had that, and was encouraged in that by um, family, by my grandmother actually. And then I was very fortunate to meet people in academic backgrounds too, who in, encouraged that, worked with them, and developed um, a course in integrated ecology at Monash. But, but very early in the piece, I always had an interest in the land primarily. And then that overlapped from a physical thing to a, an emotional thing and then came into contact with native people. And um, that brought in uh, a spiritual understanding, even though that's you know, different and not connected to my own culture, it still brought a, a sense of humility and gratitude. Um, which which kind of eventually evolved into a program that's not really based on any cultural system or belief, but mainly just on us and the land. We're running pretty short of time, but okay. could you briefly describe, uh, and it, there may be many Aboriginal groups in Australia, but at least the one that Nancy talked about, the Menashe? Mimli. Mim Mimli, excuse Mimli me, Mimli people. What, could you give us a brief description of, of them and their life? Uh, Mimli community is... Um, Situated probably about five hours southwest of Alice Springs, it's a, a, a small community of about 250 people who live. There's about five or six of those communities um, in the outback, and you know they've lived on that community most of their lives. They are pitted and Jara. They're pitted and Jara people. Pitted and Jara. It's a hard mm -hmm. word to spell, and that's their first language. Well, that no, that has been the perfect conclusion. We just went out of time. I'm sorry. The clock always wins on this program. Thank you both, Susan <laughs> okay. and Nancy, for being with us. We appreciate it very much. Ladies and gentlemen, I am sure that you have found this program intriguing. It's a very different subject for us, and we love finding those subjects for you, and, and we thank you for being with us today. Uh, next week, we will come to you again, and we will discuss a, a different subject, as we do from week to week, and we hope you'll be with us that time uh, for that subject. Until then, uh, please have a good week. I am Tony Stewart. North Idaho College Public Forum is the longest running public television show of its type in North America and is seen in seven states and two Canadian provinces. Each episode is pre-recorded live and is an educational community outreach from North Idaho College. Please join us again at this same time next week for another new edition of North Idaho College Public Forum on this public television station. <laughs>